I think you're good to go now. Okay. All right, let's get started. Um, thank you guys for coming to this tech talk, uh, which is titled Medicine, Sound Waves, and Magnets. Um, I'll introduce myself first. Uh, a little bit about me. My name is Stephen Allen. I'm a uh, assistant research professor in electrical engineering at BYU. I've been here for three years and I'm headed kind of straight into my fourth year here at BYU. My background is in physics and biomedical engineering. And uh, I have here a picture of a chimera because at BYU, I kind of have two jobs and I'm gonna talk about a little bit about both of them. Um, the first is, is I manage BYU's magnetic resonance imaging facility. So this is a research dedicated imaging facility. It was founded in 2012. And our mission is to try to get as many students as possible to have really cool experiences conducting research with this machine. So we have uh, students come who study uh, injury recovery in dancers and football players. We have other students who come and use the machine to study uh, brain activity during sleep. We have studies investigating diabetes, back pain, muscle soreness after exercise, ACL repair. Uh, it's a pretty wide variety. We have people coming from the School of Business, the Department of Dance, Exercise Science, Physics, Engineering. Really, the only departments that I have yet to get to participate at this facility are uh, university administration uh, and art and music and music theater. So uh, those are kind of my next next people I want to get uh, involved at this facility. And I'm just going to show a really cool time-lapse video. So this was founded in 2012. And our MRI scanner we bought um, used, it was constructed in 2004. Uh, there it is coming out. And we replaced it with a brand new one. So, so BYU administration was really uh, generous. And they also kind of caught the vision of what we're trying to do and they helped us get a new MRI scanner so we can keep doing this for, for years to come. Uh, so the old scanner was about 28,000 pounds and it had a special forklift. And the new scanner, uh, you can see it being installed right there, weighs 17,000 pounds. So it's a, it's a little bit lighter. Uh, and so that is up and running and we are operational. Okay, so that's one of my jobs at BYU. The second one is, is a standard uh, professor. So I teach courses and I also conduct research. And I'm happy to talk about the research that my lab does uh, with you guys right now. Um, so I'm going to talk about three diseases of interest. So these are uh, human diseases uh, that my research and my lab, we are trying to use our engineering skills to try to come up with better ways to understand and treat these diseases. So uh, I'll be discussing mental health, essential tremor, and pediatric brain tumors. Uh, so let's first talk about mental health. Um, this is becoming a more common topic of discussion. Um, mental health affects proxy, uh, you know, mental health issues such as depression, anxiety, um, uh, com compulsion, obsession. Uh, they affect approximately one in five adults. Um, it seems to, we seem to be ha both have greater awareness of these issues and, and they seem to be more prevalent nowadays. Uh, one of the issues with treating these diseases, uh, mental health disorders, are uh, both a lack of effective treatments and also a poor biological understanding of what our brains are actually doing uh, when we suffer from these diseases. Um, so my lab is interested in a potential tool to both treat and uh, understand mental health disorders, and it's called focused ultrasound. I have here a little diagram on the right-hand side uh, of what we hope focused ultrasound neuromodulation can do, which is you have a like a single applicator or a phased array applicator or emitter that emits acoustic waves at ultrasonic frequencies, so 200, uh, roughly 200 kilohertz or above. Um, and these acoustic waves propagate through the skin, intact skin and skull, uh, and propagate down toward a focus somewhere inside the brain. Um, so this focus is small, it's spatially localized, 
It's also transient in time. And if you build your array of transducers correctly, you can kind of focus the sound to uh, most locations in the brain. Uh, we can also do this at low power and cause reversible effects in the brain. So hopefully what you can see is a potentially really nice tool to use ultrasound to uh, kind of poke and prod the brain and see what happens. And also as a therapeutic tool to kind of modify the brain uh, of somebody who's uh, perhaps suffering from some of these diseases and, and hopefully help them uh, live a better life, you know, uh, have better symptoms uh, or, or kind of stop some of the symptoms of their disease. Um, so I didn't invent this. Uh, there are many researchers in the field, uh, investigators, and I just want to cover some of the results that they've, they've found. So this is a lab that has found that focused ultrasound modulates the activity of the primary somatosensory cortex in humans. That's really exciting. Uh, focused ultrasound can kind of modulate activity. Uh, but then there's another group that says, well, wait a second, we found that focus ultrasound suppresses uh, action potentials in rat brain. So they don't modify uh, the firing rates that, that we observe in the brain. They just suppress brain activity. Uh, and then here's another group that says, well, actually what we found is that ultrasound, focus ultrasound doesn't stimulate or modify uh, brain activity. And it also doesn't suppress brain activity, but it seems to create a more fertile ground so that if you have some kind of stimulus for the brain, it becomes easier to stimulate the brain. brain. And then finally, here's another group in the field that says, well, wait a second. No, 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 no. Focus ultrasound does activate the brain but it doesn't do so directly. You just simply have sound conducting through the bones, the skull bone into the ear, and you're just activating the auditory pathways of the brain. Uh, so hopefully what you can see is that in this field of research, it's kind of a jungle out there. There's uh, lots of different contradictory results. People seem to have inconsistent uh, results from their experiments. Uh, and why might this be? Uh, so one reason is, of course, that the brain is, is inherently complex. So if you shoot sound in one spot, you may get a different response because the brain is, is just really complicated. Um, but another important reason is that for all of these experiments that I've shown you, all of these results, the actual acoustic field that's being deposited into the subject is unknown. And the reason for that is that uh, human skulls and animal skulls are acoustically attenuating and acoustically aberrating. So when you send in an, an ultrasound wave, it gets warped. And like a fingerprint, every human skull is unique. Uh, so for every experiment you do, the ultrasound field uh, undergoes a unique attenuating and warping procedure or operation. Uh, and so for this reason, if we don't have an actual measurement of the acoustic field, we have um, imperfect control uh, over our experimental parameters. And there is no known way so far to measure the acoustic field in a living subject without inserting a probe in, into their brain. Um, so what my lab is trying to do is develop a remote hydrophone using magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, so basically, if you have an acoustic wave that, that's simulated here on the left, a longitudinal pressure wave, uh, we want to produce something here like what's here on the right-hand side, which is a quantitative measure in a, of an acoustic prop, uh, wave propagating uh, through something. And this image is taken using a magnetic resonance imaging device. Um, so uh, the idea that I'm proposing to you is not entirely new. Uh, in the 90s, there was a group in Toronto um, uh, by the last name of Plews and Walker who built this custom device. It's a Maxwell pair uh, uh, electromagnetic coil um, uh, with a, a ultrasound device and a, a gel uh, that can 
conduct acoustic waves. Uh, they built this device and they were able to produce the image that's up here on the right hand side. Um, it's a pretty amazing achievement. There are some practical reasons why development of that device and its translation into humans stopped. Um, so I have here on the right hand side kind of a schematic of the Plusenbacher device. You've got these two red coils that represent a Maxwell pair electromagnet, electromagnet. And this kind of orange fuzzy region is the region over which this device can sensitize MR images to acoustic propagation. And finally, this TX means transducer, and it kind of indicates acoustic waves as they propagate into this region of sensitivity. Now, hopefully what you can see is it is this, this these small pair of coils with their region of sensitivity. It's quite difficult to place a, a human head or the brain that you want to examine inside this device. It's too small. It also uh, consumes a considerable amount of power, 175 watts of power. Um, it's not just not quite ready for translation into human use. Um, so our lab, our idea is to remove one of the coils. Instead of having a pair of coils in this electromagnet design, let's just use one coil. There's advantages and disadvantages with this design choice. Advantages include uh, greatly reduced power consumption, a smaller form factor that is then, as you can see on the right-hand side, compatible with human use. Uh, and because it's more efficient, you can produce very large magnetic fields, which we want to do. Um, the trade-off is that the um, magnetic field produced by this single coil is uh, less focused, uh, less linear, uh, and a little more difficult to deal with mathematically. Uh, but we feel like that is a trade-off that we can deal with. Um, so my student, David Cavinato, who's shown on the upper right-hand side, he's kind of uh, designed the driving system for this coil. He's built the coil. Uh, we've been able to take magnetic field measurements off the coil, and they, they fit the specifications that we need them to do. Uh, the whole setup has about 0.3 ohms of resistance, um, so we have to have a transformer to, to match the impedance. Um, it takes, it can, we can drive about 12 amps of current through this device, uh, which produces the magnetic field that we need. Um, and at least here's like a little uh, a 3D picture of, of how we envision this device will work. Um, we found that it consumes 23 watts of power as opposed to 173, 175 watts of power. Um, and uh, it also doesn't heat up and or undergo Lorentz forces when it's in the MRI scanner. Um, so uh, the coil works great. Uh, my other student, Carson Reed, he is building the missing piece, which is the ultrasound applicator. Um, so here's a little picture of a, of a prototype ultrasound applicator that he built um, to generate the acoustic field. We also need to quantify it in a water tank using hydrophones so we can compare uh, the water tank measurements to what we observe with the MRI scanner and confirm the accuracy of the MRI scanner. Um, so our hope is that we can create this device that can do neuromodulation, but also uh, have the acoustic field that does the neuromodulation be remotely quantified and characterized for each subject that undergoes an experiment. Um, and we have a lot more work to do, especially we need to drive more electric current and produce even stronger magnetic fields if we want to uh, visualize acoustic fields deeper in the brain. Okay, so uh, that is our uh, a summary of our work uh, for mental health and, and focused ultrasound neuromodulation. The next disease that I'd like to talk about is a disease called essential tremor. Um, essential tremor is a movement disorder. Uh, what that means, it, it affects about 10% of the population and it particularly affects uh, older population. Uh, what we, I mean by movement disorder is that uh, people with this disease, if they try to drink a glass of water or button their shirt or shake your hand, or in the case of this picture, if they try to draw a pencil between this, the two lines of this spiral pattern, their hands start to shake uncontrollably. 
Uh, and the disease can progress to the point where you can no longer feed yourself, uh, you can no longer uh, dress yourself. Uh, people tend to, to so socially withdraw when they have this disease because they can't wave hello, they can't shake your hand. Um, and what we'd like to do is restore a, a patient's control over their hands so that if they were to draw the circle here on the right-hand side, they can maintain enough control uh, to keep the pencil within, within the two lines. So hopefully you can see that essential tremor, while not deadly, does represent a severe loss in quality of life. Um, it turns out ultrasound can be used to uh, diminish the symptoms uh, experienced in, in essential tremor. Um, and uh, the way that, that we've managed to be able to do this is we have a hemispherical shell full of about 1,024 individual ultrasound applicators. They all produce an acoustic beam that propagates through this blue water coupling bath. Uh, the red lines represent the acoustic beams. The ultrasound waves propagate through the intact skin, the intact skull, and then focus down to a single point about the size of a grain of rice. And if we've placed that grain of rice in the right spot in the brain, uh, it will heat up, it'll absorb energy and heat up and eventually ablate or kind of cook the neurons that are associated with this shaking pattern. And if we just burn that right spot, uh, then afterward, the subject shaking uh, disappears and they're able to feed themselves, they're able to drink water, clothe themselves, they're kind of, they have this kind of miraculous recovery simply because we've cooked this tiny little spot right in the middle of the brain. Now I can probably tell what you're thinking, which in my case, I would be thinking, well, I hope that surgeon places that grain of spot, grain of rice in the right spot. Um, and to help surgeons do that, we do this whole procedure with the ultrasound in a magnetic resonance imaging scanner. And the magnetic resonance imaging scanner can monitor the temperatures that are induced by this treatment uh, and can make sure uh, that the uh, that grain of rice is at the right spot in the brain. Uh, the target is called the Ventura intermediate nucleus of the thalamus in the brain. Uh, now, you may think, okay, that's pretty cool. I know somebody who could benefit from this treatment. Uh, but the sad fact is not everybody is a good candidate for this sort of treatment. Uh, and the reason is uh, for the exact same reason I described above, which is that every skull is unique. And some people have skulls that are incompatible with treatment. Uh, what I mean by incompatible with treatment is uh, represented by this picture right here. On the right-hand side, we have this thick skull that nicely uh, conducts ultrasound. This is a good candidate skull. On the left-hand side, this skull has uh, a really uh, thick section of marrow in the, in the skull, and marrow is highly absorbing uh, for ultrasound. So as the acoustic beams propagate through the skull, they get absorbed, and uh, the marrow heats up. And eventually the skull, the marrow in the skull may heat up so much that it may start to damage the surface of the brain that's right up against the skull. Um, so for this reason, if you go to get a focus ultrasound treatment for essential tremor, you will first get a CT scan of your skull and your surgeon will look at your skull and they might say, I'm sorry, but we can't treat you because the risk of of heating up your skull and damaging the surface of your brain is too great. You'll have to find some other treatment method. Um, my la uh, uh, well, before I get to that point, I just wanna point out that one way to, to reduce this problem is to use this blue acoustic coupling bath as a heat sink. So it's chilled to about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. It's pretty cold and uh, it's able to wick away heat from, from the skull. Um, this water bath is kept static. It's not circulated, although it would be vastly more efficient as a heat sink if we were able to circulate it. The reason why we can't circulate the water 
is because moving water destroys the MRI images. So I have here some examples of MR images. The red arrows point to different ways that the water bath there, that, that heat sink water bath, um, disrupts the ability of the images to, do, to work their magic. And as I said before, we rely on imaging to make sure that the grain of rice is at the right location in the brain. So we cannot tolerate anything that will disrupt the quality of the MR images. And we therefore cannot circulate the water. But if we could circulate water, it would be a much more efficient heat sink and it would allow, allow a larger population of patients to enjoy the benefits of this treatment. So uh, this is where my lab comes in. Our hypothesis is maybe we could replace this water with something that is both invisible to the MRI scanner, but it's still able to act as a heat sink and wick heat away from the skull during these treatments. Um, so one of my collaborators, Dr. Rick Davis at Virginia Tech has uh, helped us invent this fluid. He basically creates these iron oxide particles with a really special coating on them. And if we sprinkle these particles into the water bath, it turns an image like here on the right-hand side where you have this bright water bath that's moving and causing all kinds of fuzziness in this gel target that's, this gel is pretending to be a human head. And if we just sprinkle some of these particles at about a 3.1 millimolar concentration uh, into the water bath, then even though the water bath is present, and it's moving around and circulating, all of those imaging problems just kind of disappear because those particles render the water bath invisible to the MRI scanner. Uh, and so our, our, our goal and hope is that we can use these particles to allow continuous water circulation during these treatments, which will efficiently cool the skull allow surgeons to transmit more energy into patients with highly attenuative, attenuative skulls. Um, so there's some like technical results, which we've been able to show that the precision and accuracy of the MRI scanner improves when we use this nanofluid. Um, and we have also have qualitative data that show uh, when we use water on the left, we have like fuzziness in this image. And sometimes we have these aliasing patterns that you can see on the top and bottom of the image. And then if we just simply replace the fluid and take identical pictures, here on the right hand side, a lot of the errors in the image go away. We have improved contrast to noise uh, as indicated by this, this, these blue arrows. Um, this project is really fun because it's a balance between so many physical properties. There's acoustic properties such as impedance and attenuation, uh, likelihood of cavitation, mechanical properties such as viscosity and thermal uh, con conductivity. Uh, there's magnetic resonance imaging properties such as relaxivity, signal to noise, contrast, resolution. And then there's chemical nanoparticle properties such as stability, opacity, and toxicity. And all of these properties all have to kind of be in balance with each other as we design these fluids. Um, so there's a lot more work to be done. We want to optimize the, these particles, optimize the fluid properties, quantify uh, the benefits um, of, of using this fluid as opposed to just water. And also, is there a way we can optimize the fluid flow states to maximize cooling in the skull and, and allow more patients to benefit from the surgery? Okay, we are on to the last, the last disease. Uh, that I want to talk about, which is pediatric brain tumors. So we also have a pediatric brain tumor project in my lab. So pediatric brain tumors are a minority of the total um, brain tumor population. About 4,300 children are diagnosed every year in the United States. Um, uh, these children have a 30% survival rate. 30% survival rate is, is not great. Um, but it is far, far better than it used to be. Um, one of the major problems with, with uh, pediatric patients is when they survive, they oftentimes suffer from what are called late effects. Late effects 
um, is this kind of euphemistic term that refers to the long-term consequences of, of chemotherapy, um, tumor resection, and radiation treatment. So if you're a 60, 70-year-old person and you undergo chemotherapy, you're not really worried about the effects of chemotherapy on your body 30 years down the road. But we hope that our pediatric population, we hope that they'll live for 60, 70 years. And the effects of radiation and chemotherapy kind of um, can be kind of difficult to live with over that long period of time. I mean, you have uh, uh, toxicity issues, uh, you're at a much higher likelihood of cardiac problems when you undergo chemotherapy. Radiation treatments can uh, destroy a tumor but it can also increase the likelihood of getting more tumors in the future. You know, the, these late effects cause a lot of problems for the pediatric population. They cause a lot of problems for kids. Um, so my lab, we, we are investigating a treatment called histotripsy. This is once again a focused ultrasound treatment where we have an array of acoustic uh, applicators that propagate sound through the skull into the brain. Except this time, uh, we modify the uh, wave patterns, the acoustic wave patterns, so that instead of depositing heat, the acoustic waves kind of fracture apart the water that's inside tissue, and they produce these really transient and violent cavities of bubbles. We call it cavitation. Um, it's ultrasound triggered. You have to use dedicated hardware to, to cause these bubbles to form. The bubbles in their local environment are incredibly violent. They're also transient in time. Uh, here on the right-hand side is an example of liver cells uh, who have been exposed to these bubbles. So untreated liver cells on the upper right-hand side, they look normal, they look happy and healthy, they have a lot of structure. But cells that have been exposed to these bubbles these bubbles are just completely emulsified. They're completely destroyed. Um, and so our hope is that this treatment, if we were to expose pediatric tumor cells to these bubbles, then the tumors would be destroyed. Um, now, because it's a ultrasound treatment, it's non-ionizing, so you don't have the late effects associated with uh, radiation. It's also non-toxic, so you avoid uh, late effects associated with chemotherapy, and it's non-invasive, so you can avoid some of the late effects associated with surgery. Uh, so we think this could really benefit the pediatric tumor population. Um, now, histotripsy is uh, really cool, but everybody who's able to do it does it with, um, really specialized, expensive, difficult to manufacture ultrasound transducers. Um, using new devices is uh, uh, taking a new device through the entire regulatory pathway into clinical use is incredibly hard. And it would be way faster uh, more efficient and more cost-effective and uh, easier from a hospital business model sense if we could do histotripsy using these clinical focused ultrasound transducers that we use for essential tremor. Um, this would be really great. A lot of people have been very interested in doing this kind of conversion, but uh, most people have agreed that it's impossible. So this, this paper here is like a theoretical paper that says, all the theory says that we shouldn't be able to do histotripsy cavitation using these existing clinical devices. Um, but meanwhile, my colleague, Dr. Henry Godin at the University of Utah, seems to have found uh, a particular kind of incantation of acoustic pulsing parameters that produces histotripsy-like effects in tissue samples. They seem to produce bubbles that emulsify tissue rather than thermally ablating tissue. Um, and we don't know why. Uh, it seems like the, uh, the field has a, a consensus, other researchers have a consensus that this should be uh, sort of impossible to do using this clinical device, but we seem to be able to produce results that, that, that counteract all of their claims, and, and we're not sure why. 
So Dr. Odin and I have created what we call our matrix of hypotheses, which is where like, this isn't even the whole matrix. It's this huge spreadsheet uh, where every column represents a hypothesis for what's going on. And then every row represents an experiment that we could try using this device and the results that would then be predicted uh, by each hypothesis. And so what we've had to do is create enough observations so that each hypothesis has like a unique uh, pattern of observations. And so if we just kind of run through all of these experiments, we hope to be able to identify what is the mechanism that's causing histotripsy using this transducer and how can we optimize it so that we can uh, uh, treat pediatric brain tumors or eventually, you know, translate it into pediatric brain tumor treatments. So uh, my student Libby uh, Allen up here on the right hand side is helping construct ultrasound targets. They're uh, made out of gels um, that with, with tunable acoustic attenuation properties, tun tunable mechanical stiffness properties. Um, and also they produce in MR images some nice bright contrast when we shoot them with ultrasound so we can see where we're shooting and how effective we are at, at treating. And uh, these gels are kind of key to that row of experiments that I described above. Um, so I think I've gone on for, for about 30 minutes. Um, we have other projects and there's other people using the MRI facility. Um, there's just too much to talk about. So I want to thank everybody for your time at this tech talk. And I also have to thank all of my students here at BYU and collaborators at other places and funding sources. Um, and I think now we can transition into question time.